So let me move to the next topic. This is the last topic for small networks, and it's about shuffle net. The idea is that you have your input. Let's forget about the resolution for now, and let's just look at the channels. Your input is going to have these many channels. If you do a group convolution, we just saw what is a group convolution. So you're doing your convolutions on different chunks of your channels, and you're doing it independently. If you do that, you're going to end up with some features, and the features are independent from your inputs. If you do another group convolution, still the features are going to be independent, and then your channels are not talking to each other. This is good if you have three GPUs and you want your GPUs not to interfere with e each other's jobs, but then uh, mathematically you're losing information because maybe the information in this part of your input is important for the features that you're going to end up with here and here. So one way to fix this is to mix stuff. After the first independent channels up until here, you do a group convolution, then you mix and match. You say, okay, the first part should go here, the second part should go here, the third part should go here for my group convolution, the second group convolution. The green ones, you separate them and you push them through different group convolutions with different parameters. And you do the same thing for the blue ones. Now the color is changing, indicating that now you did some mix and matching for your channels. Now you mix things up channel-wise. Now the output of these two operations are going to have information coming from different groups. But this is not an efficient way of implementing stuff. The efficient way of implementing it is the first group convolution is the same as before, but now you shuffle your channels. And this operation is very simple. I'm going to tell you what the exact code is going to look like. Looks Once you like, do that, it looks like that is exactly the same as what you drew in diagram. Yes, but now there is an operation. There is an efficient operation that we're going to do. Okay. And then it's going to be exactly what you said. It's going to give you the exact same output as B. Mathematically, they are the same, but implementation wise, how are we going to implement this? And first, what are the applications? The applications we know. It's about robots, drones, smartphones, etc. So how do you implement channel shuffle? You have G as your number of groups. In this case, you have one, two, three groups. N is the number of channels per group. I don't know, let's say you have 10 channels per each group. And the total number of channels is gonna be G times N. That's the total size of the input channel. You're gonna reshape to G N. So we are just gonna do a reshape operation in Python. You first do a reshape, it's going to be GN. Now it's a two-dimensional array. You transpose that array, you flatten it. So you reshape it back to a one-dimensional. So you start from something one-dimensional, which has size, size G times N. You reshape it, you make it a matrix, and then you flatten it back. You transpose it and then you flatten it back. Then it's going to give you a channel shuffle. So it's very cheap. This operation is very cheap and smart, actually. That was the microstructure. The macrostructure is gonna look like this. Uh, this is what you have for a residual connection. You do one by one, depth-wise separable convolution and then one by one. Before you do your second convolution, you do a channel shuffle. And if you want to have a different stride, you first do your channel shuffle. You do a stride of two here and a stride of two here and then add the outcomes. This is when you want to reduce the resolution this is when you want to keep the resolution the same. And channel shuffle oper operation is very simple. This is what you do when you code it up. And you can study the effect of different groups. If your group size is one, two, three, four, and eight, and if you try to keep the complexity the same, you're gonna need to play around with the dimensions a little bit. And this is how it compares to VGG, GoogleNet, and AlexNet with different group sizes. And the complexity is going down. So this is the complexity compared to AlexNet. It's 38, but then you have similar classification error. And you can have different versions of your shuffle net with different uh, resolution. I think I'm finished right, I, right on time. Uh, do you have any questions? For those of you who have questions, you can stay and ask. And the ones who want to leave, you're more than welcome to leave. What are the numbers after the like shuffle net 0.5, shuffle net 1? What does that indicate to Is that... It's the number of channels, the multiplier. Okay. It's very similar to Google Net. So they're not modifying VGG 
they're just putting it next to it because it has similar error. Is that correct? Exactly. So they are putting it next to it. And as you can see here, they are trying to keep the same, keep the computational complexity the same or of the same order, but with different groups. Why? Because then it's going to be very easy for them to compare to networks of similar size. So they just have similar sizes in terms of parameters. And the shuffle isn't something that's learned, right? It's, it's the same every time. Yes. So there is nothing learned here. It's just reshuffling, rearranging the furniture. You first take a vector, turn it into a matrix, transpose the matrix, flatten it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. And I wasn't, so it seems like it's a structured, like it's the same order every time. It's not like a random thing. No, it's the same order. Nothing is random here. Do you know if people have tried anything sort of more randomized there or more learned or I guess just different besides this sort of deterministic shuffling? Uh, I think if you put a dropout right after the outcome of your shuffle, that's going to randomize stuff. But have I seen a paper do that? No, I haven't. I'm sure there exists a paper that does that in a random fashion. Okay. But you want to have control here over the outcome because in the end you want to take this network and put it into production. You don't want things to be random in production. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. So maybe some sort of like learned way, learned shuffling would, I don't know, it may not be better, but it might at least make sense, I guess. Yeah, but the big picture is that no matter how you want to do it, it's a pretty efficient way of doing it, but no matter how you want to do it, you want to mix and match the information across different channels. Mm -hmm. If you take that idea home, that's great. But So the thing is, I feel like a, a normal convolution is sort of mixes and matches channels anyway, right? If you do a convolution, it combines information to different feature vectors using you know, different combinations of the channels. Is, is this just really efficient because they can split the previous layers into like parallel threads basically and only shuffle when they want to? Why is it more efficient than a regular channel, regular convolution? The answer is these are smaller matrices and you're doing smaller matrix vector multiplication. And that's why it's more efficient. Well, and this is only like applicable because we're doing this particular, we're doing these group convolutions. Exactly. In, in, in other networks where you're not doing a group convolution, it's just, it, that's not even, a, it's not applicable. Yes, but what is the objective here for small networks? You yeah, want I, to be... Yeah, just like reducing parameters and increasing like, or reducing runtime, I guess. Yeah, so we are looking for methods to do that. Yeah. One method was grouping. The other method was uh, one by one convolutions. The other method was depth wise separable convolutions. And this is another method, channel shuffle. Very cheap and very efficient. The idea is brilliant. This is very yeah, and it works really well. I mean, I don't like I wouldn't I don't know why you pick a Google net over you know, the, if it's performing about the same and has way smaller complexity. If you look at it, it has the same structure as Google net with another addition, the channel shuffle. But just ten times less complexity. Yes. So there is Google net, there is shuffle net. Which I mean I, I agree with Sarush's point. Has the same structure as mobile net. But yes, Sarush is right. Why would you choose Google Net if you have Shuffle Net here? In terms of complexity, it's much more efficient. And I feel like everything I see always just uses, you know, like BGG and never, even though it's very, you know, similar. Oh, there is a reason for that. When we go to transfer learning, you're going to see why. Just because uh, there's so much for VGG, like there's so much existing. Exactly. Sort of data, or not data, I guess, but like models. When you write a paper in deep learning, you need to be able to compare it with the rest of the literature. And you want to always change small things. You don't want to change your entire structure because you want to do a fair comparison with the rest of the literature. That's why you see VGG 16 in most of the papers. Yeah. So, I see. so you use a VGG like backbone and change you know, the top layers. Um, okay, yeah. But, so, but couldn't you argue that because we have like an order of magnitude less complexity that uh, we can train things so much faster. In so but much I wonder easier. if I wonder if the point is that like when we get to transfer learning, you might want those extra parameters uh, to make your model more adaptable to like a change. Maybe that's just a guess. But isn't transfer learning useful because it like gives us a speed up in training and 
right? Or are you talking about transfer learning more in like the data set, like the data? Yes, that one we are gonna talk about later and we're gonna go into more details. But usually what you do is, for instance, you wanted to do object detection. You take the first few layers of VGG16 and you fix them so there is no training going on. And then you just change the, or fine tune uh, the last layers where you have the full So does transfer learning, uh, so does that term apply to both transfer learning for like the parameters for a model and transfer learning for like data to sort of a similar data, but different? Because that's how I've used it, heard it used before. I think I've only heard it in the first case, yeah, but maybe it's both. It's both. And it's not a difficult concept. You are just fine tuning your parameters. I think it's a, it's a ask a little further, why not fine tune on top of ShuffleNet? Is like, is there some inherent reason that fine tuning on a larger network works better? Or could you do either? You can, you definitely can. If you want to have something in production, you want to have something more efficient. But if you want to do research and write a paper, that's a different story because then you need to be able to compare to the rest of the literature. Okay? I see. At some point, maybe it'll switch to everyone using a different architecture and then then you kind of modify and adapt. Yeah, hopefully. And most of these papers were written prior to 2018. So this is pretty new. Not that new in deep learning, but still new. I just and had a, one other different question um, about depth-wise convolutions. Um, so th there's, in that case, there's just one filter per channel. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. There is one filter per channel. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Have a good weekend. Yeah, you too. Enjoy. Thanks, Okay.